As educators, we all want the best for our students. We want them to experience academic success so they experience personal fulfillment. However, the challenge and focus of much research is how do we achieve this very daunting task? Hello, my name is Ray Roberts, and today I want to talk to you about student-centered learning, the literature, and most importantly, the mindset we educators need to help students reach their full potential. Before I begin, please do us a huge favor and show us some teacher love by liking this video and subscribing to this channel. This will motivate us to continue to provide you with content concerning teaching and learning. Now, let's talk about teacher mindset and teacher at mindset as a responsibility. Recently, I read on Twitter from someone that suggests that professionals should not align themselves behind organizations, employers, brands, or sovereignties. However, the successful professional will align themselves behind values, principles, and belief constructs that drive an action to a successful end. We bring with us knowledge, perception, and values that affects our teaching. Sometimes these beliefs can advance our students' cognitive abilities, and other times, if we're not careful, our beliefs can stabilize and even make static their thinking. We must continuously improve our thinking to inform our beliefs by observing, analyzing, evaluating, and synthesizing the interactions of learning in many contexts through many lenses. This means the teacher must be a researcher. This effort means the teacher must become a researcher in the classroom. We are practitioners of teaching and learning that involves the neurosciences, sociology, the health sciences, psychology, archeology, span and other social sciences. We observe, record, and even aggregate data every day. The teacher researcher goes beyond simply collecting data for report cards, but we collect data to improve and support student learning. So what is student learning? Well, student learning is a focus on individual learners, their experiences, perspectives, backgrounds, talents, interests, and capabilities, also their needs, with the intention of engaging in teaching and learning experiences that can increase the possibility for the natural occurrence of transfer. This definition suggests that the teacher supports the experience of learning and not manage it. Teachers must be nosy and they must get to know their students. We call this learner profile. To go a step further, we can define student-centered learning through the lens of the post-method condition. The post-method condition is a three-dimensional pedagogy that gives educators a moment to think about the appropriateness of the methods, approaches, and mindset we teachers use before engaging students. Having such a structured pedagogy is vital for effective student-centered teaching in online learning. The post-method pedagogy breaks teacher engagement into three dimensions. First, we have particularity. This dimension acknowledges that teaching is a local affair. We must understand the nuances, challenges, advantages, and intentions of the learning environment, as well as the wants, needs, and expectations of our learners. Particularity calls us to learn a profile and get to know our students. Teacher as a researcher who examines the context to contextualize the learning. Next we have practicality. Practicality encourages teachers to know the literature regarding teaching and learning and familiarize ourselves with the many methods, but we also must know what methods are most appropriate for our students based on their wants, needs, and expectations. We also have possibility. Now possibility is the social reality that learning cannot be ignored. Educators must remove all as many barriers as possible to motivate and encourage students so that no obstacle is insurmountable. The exercise of destroying detrimental enculturation that can ex exist in any given learning environment is the key to developing productive student-centered learning experiences. 
So how do we define student achievement through student-centered learning? Well, post-method condition pedagogy allows stakeholders of learning to see student achievement from the eyes of learners and not standards outlined in a school district's charter. In the learner-centered classroom, student achievement is defined by the student's wants, needs, and expectations. Our beliefs are based on our experiences with reality or reality as we perceive it. These beliefs seep into our teaching just like they influence any other profession. Our beliefs are guided by philosophical assumptions that serve as the groundwork in which we engage the world. Let's discuss three of these assumptions. Epistemology. Epistemology is our explanation of how we know reality. The teacher grounded in epistemology deals in exploring questions such as, what is knowledge? How is knowledge acquired? How do we know what we know? What is the context in which knowledge is developed? The epistemological teacher will seek to ensure that the information is contextualized and allows learners to question the validity of knowledge based on how knowledge has been presented, sourced, purposed, and implemented. Next, we have ontology. Now, ontology is our view of reality. Realities are perceived, which means that there are multiple realities. The ontological teacher accepts the notion that there are more than one reality and celebrates different perspectives of knowledge and reality. This teacher encourages students to go beyond the text and synthesize the evidence based on various perspectives. Finally, we have axiology. Axiology is defined as our value of reality. We bring our values to work and these values is, allows us to interact with the world. The concepts of ethics and aesthetics derive from axiology. The axiological teacher within a learner-centered environment encourages students to explore deeper concepts relating to how knowledge will be applied to improve society or prevent hardship to people. If applied appropriately through the lens of Dr. Kamara Develu's post-method condition, we educators will begin to sequence our lessons to encourage learners to experience self-advocacy so they can perpetually self-regulate. Now let's define self-advocacy and self-regulation. Self-advocacy is the perception that someone has which assures them that they can effectively and successfully complete a task. Self-regulation is when learners become self-starters and they begin to take responsibility for their learning through directed and purposeful actions. When learners experience self-advocacy, they make meaningful attempts at learning. Their learning becomes personal and goal-oriented. Students begin to explore the question at hand and expand their search to self-constructed questions of interest and curiosity. The teacher steps to the side and becomes the cache of resources for students' goals and the expected goals devised by society. The result is, is that a post-method pedagogy produ produces self-determined learners. A self-determined learner becomes an autonomous, lifelong learner. They know how to work towards satisfying their wants, needs, and expectations through the acquisition of knowledge. And they do this by partnering, partnering with other people. So knowledge exchanges form. And these exchanges cause continuous learning transfer. The self-determined learner is intrinsically motivated, which creates the lifelong learner. This inductive concept starts with the relationship between teachers and students. Teachers believe in that their role is guiding learning, not managing it. We see this in the ideas propelled in many nations. In America, there's race to the top, which is an idea that if America gets students excited about science, they will go into the fields of science, 
technology, engineering, and mathematics, which helps the common welfare of America. In Saudi Arabia, there's a 2030 vision, which is based on the same concept of empowering Saudi nationals through the idea of independence, self-efficiency, and directed personalized learning experiences, which creates efforts and responsibilities in order to make the kingdom a powerhouse on the world stage. It will not be until we look through the lens of theory that we begin to move away from the notion that there's a best method. Prabhu said there's no best method. And we must move into the realm of a post-method condition, which is based on context. Let's look at three theories that inform methodology. And methodology is how we think about methods to form strategy. And methods are the procedures we use to engage our students towards a learning objective. First, we have cognitivism. And cognitivism is the belief that every person has a particular way of processing and storing information. Dirksen says we store and retrieve information like we organize our closet of clothes. Everyone organizes their closet a little differently. How we encode the information determines if that information makes it to our long-term memory or our closet. Then we have constructivism. Constructivism is the foundation of learner-centered education. Constructivists believe that knowledge is an internal occurrence that is developed through social interaction. Social interaction is the seed for learning and the formation of knowledge because we negotiate, assimilate, and accommodate with an intended purpose that addresses our intrinsic need. Through these personalized learning interactions, we learn so we can thrive within our environment. Finally, we have humanism. Humanism is a theory that states that people cannot be taught. People teach themselves, and learning can only be facilitated and supported by others. Remember, earlier we talked about self-determination and self-regulation. It is humanism that introduced these concepts that support student-centered learning. Just to throw in a curveball, I want to add some information or some beliefs of Dr. Diane Lawson Freeman concerning teaching and learning. Dr. Freeman's primary position is based on complexity theory. Complexity theory is the study of complex, dynamic, and adaptive systems. And learning is definitely complex, dynamic, and adaptive. Dr. Freeman's ideas on complexity theory in relation to teaching and learning promotes student-centered learning and in many ways supports the post-method condition. She believes that playing a game has a way of changing the rules. This thought speaks to both epistemology and ontology. It also speaks to axiology. It also challenges teachers' beliefs. The principles of complexity theory relating to teaching and learning can be simplified in adaptiveness, iteration, and emergence. We must be able to adapt to the learning conditions, which are the demands of the systems we teach in, and the students' wants, needs, and expectations. We must also teach students to adapt to the demands and the challenges of an unexpected life. Often, this means we must know when to let go and encourage our students to do, this, to do the same. We must provide iterative practice that allows our students to experience, therefore construct their learning from many different perspectives, conditions, and modifications. Lastly, we must understand that learning is emerging and it occurs when it occurs. We simply must be patient, reassuring, and reflective, so we are continuously applying the most appropriate method. Finally, the purpose of today's discussion was to talk about how we form and modify our teaching beliefs to, to support student-centered learning. However, 
It would be unfortunate if I did not offer some insight onto how student-centered learning can be applied in the context of online learning. Technology supports student-centered learning. Online learning specifically serves to promote student-centered learning. Students must experience self-advocacy to be successful online. They must be comfortable with the technology, which includes both the hardware and the software they are using. Teachers must work with the education technology administrator to ensure they select the most appropriate hardware and software that streamlines the ease of use. Teachers must ensure that they provide as many resources as possible on the learning management system, the LMS, to allow students to clarify instructions and content, confirm the content, visualize the content, hear the content, and practice the content. Teachers must be assuring at all times while teaching online. All communication should be positive and affirming. The teacher's tone must be friendly. Teachers must make themselves available via email, text message, or the LMS chatting system. Some schools and universities even offer a 24-hour tutoring and help desk to help students. Also, remember the goal is to create students who experience self-advocacy, self-regulation, and self-determination. And there are some applications that help you do that, such as Google Docs, Padlet, Google, Flipgrid, Kahoot, Verso, Monosnap, Socrative. There are many apps to help students with problem-based learning, task-based learning, cooperative learning, and even living classrooms. Well, I have given you a lot to think about. Please feel free to leave a comment below if you'd like for us to go into any detail about any topic mentioned in this video. By the way, do not forget to like and subscribe to this channel. Show us some love if you like the video. My name is Ray Roberts. Happy teaching.